Hey, Jim Mahara here. Welcome to the channel or welcome back to the channel. And hey, if you've been watching some videos or listening to some of my podcasts on this channel, you've been finding them helpful and you haven't subscribed yet, well, please do hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and help this channel grow because maybe then maybe more people like yourself who hopefully are enjoying some of my content or are finding it helpful, then more people can find it. If you subscribe, hit that notification bell, and, you know, whatever happens after that, I guess it helps in the algorithm or something. So I was just going to respond to a comment uh, on a video I did quite a while ago, I think five years ago or something. I don't know. DPD, how borderlines think and lack of logic. And a commenter says, they ask for so much patience, understanding, and to be, quote, just love the way they are, unquote without even loving themselves the way they are. This is very true. In return, they have absolutely no space for you and how they make you feel or the amount of your needs that they probably don't meet. I never had a conversation that resulted in a logical conclusion. Once the trigger flattens one, is just forced to forget and forgive or incite another round of anger, hyperarousal and accuse. It's high conflict, isn't it? It's high conflict more than not as the relationship not really progresses, but starts to devolve, especially from what people think it's going to be in the beginning. That's a rude awakening. That's painful. And the commenter continues, it's heartbreaking to feel their loneliness and trying to connect, but constantly being accused of doing it the wrong way. And it's very hard to emphasize with them. While they are at least to, to be okay, they seem to be okay with making you suffer. Sometimes I feel they can only access their own feelings when mirrored through the other. It's interesting because that's not 100% true because they're not always mirroring their feelings through you. They might be at times, and they're seeking identity through you, but they're often in repetition compulsion, triggered re repetition compulsion cycles of reacting and responding to you the way that they reacted and responded to their parents or a parent, and then they don't know the difference in the here and now with emotional dysregulation and or some dissociation between who you really are and they experience you as that object other bad parent representation and I've had so many clients tell me yeah I really felt like this person's mother or father or whatever the case may be and I think that it's just really poignant that the commenter says so I'm going to rephrase it now but people with BPD ask for so much patience understanding, and to be just loved for who they are. They don't even know who they are. They don't like who they are or who they might think they are. And so you're trying to love them in spite of everything, and they can't even give you consistent love, if any love at all, because they don't attach to you. So you know, it's it's not only the beginning phase, the idealization phase and all of that, but that's a big contributor to how people don't have a clue what's coming next. And and they have they ask for so much and they really as you get to know more about who they aren't, they really have less and less and less, if anything at all, to give you. But you have to keep giving to them or they're going to be all kinds of unhappy and mad at you and projecting all over you and yelling and screaming at you or giving you the silent treatment and ghosting you. But they do ask for so much patience and understanding. Just want to be loved for who they are. And I, I, I love that the commenter added this too, without even loving themselves the way they are, which is absolutely true. They don't know themselves. They don't understand themselves. A lot of times when people with BPD hurt you really badly, they hurt themselves really badly too. But it doesn't excuse what they're doing to you. And they just don't have any space to return anything to you or, or to have any awareness 
of how you end up feeling or how they quote make you feel about your unmet needs. You have a lot of unmet needs. There's no mutuality or reciprocity in these types of relationships with people with BPD. They're too emotionally immature for that. And they do have an arrested emotional development by or before the age of two. So I'm not trying to insult people with BPD. I'm just trying to explain how it really is. And it is heartbreaking. And then, now, yeah, I just want to mention this part too, because when the commoner says it's heartbreaking to feel their loneliness and trying to connect, but constantly being accused of doing it the wrong way. And that happens because people with BPD don't know how to connect. Because... Usually, it's 87% or so of people diagnosed with BPD have had a lot of childhood trauma and then this arrested emotional development. And then they don't go on to develop the rest of the way through childhood. And, you know, this is just part of what BPD is about, but it's, it's sort of the foundation along with whatever else they might say it is because it doesn't really matter. It, it can be changed and it can be healed. And people can have much better lives and, and they don't have to continue to have BPD. And people can go to treatment and, and, and if they spend enough time and years and work in therapy that is specifically geared toward helping people with BPD, they don't have to always split, you know, like for their whole life. They don't have to have this defense mechanism. They can outgrow, not outgrow, but unlearn things and learn other things and find themselves makes an immense difference. But more people than not now, you know, I mean, there's people always getting help and people trying to get help and people trying to do their best and some people getting somewhere with it. Maybe a lot of people aren't or things go wrong in therapy or they don't really engage it. But people with BPD don't know how to connect to you. That's why they make it impossible for you to really feel connected to them, especially after a certain point when there's more and more devaluation, more and more negativity, more and more defense on their part. And then when they're dealing with the um, engulfment, abandonment, you know, the push-pull, the push-pull, it, it, it's, as this commenter says, you know, they, they ask for so much patience, understanding it to be loved for who they are when they don't even love themselves for who they are. And think about it. Without that sense of self, they lack identity. I've been reading so many research papers here and there, I do. And it's funny how many of them, not ha-ha funny, ironically, ridiculously, like um, obsolete maybe to keep studying this. But, but they keep studying these, these questions. It's always like, is, is loss of self really the core of BPD? Is that really? Yeah, it is. It is. We've known that for a long time. But they keep studying it. They keep writing it in different ways and whatever. But, yeah, I think I could tell you with a lot of assuredness now, with all those studies, all I already knew before that, whatever, that people with BPD have a lost self. And they're living through a false self. And there's some pathological narcissism in BPD. But the saddest thing is, really, for people with BPD, whether they know it or not, they don't know how to connect. And if they do connect, it's going to be very in short bursts, very inconsistent, very, they just don't know how to attach. It's disorganized attachment. They don't feel your love because they're too scared of it, really. They want it, but they don't know how to handle it. And they have nowhere to put it because there's no self. And so with all of this being true, you know, how people with BPD think is kind of tragic because it's all magical thinking. They don't really think separately from how they feel, they just feel that what they feel is all really real. And that can be misleading all over the place. So I think that, and the commenter also said uh, toward the end of the comment, because they can't connect to you, that's number one. They're not going to connect. You might think they were, you might think they did, but they don't. And that's why they can get gone so fast too, because there's, there's just no commitment there. There's just no attachment there. There's just no depth or consistency or congruency of affect, of feeling, of commitment, because there's no self there. And that's really, I think, the key thing people need to understand. The thing I've talked about a lot, that I get a lot of comments back going, I don't really get it. I hear you, but I don't really get it. Uh, so maybe I'll just keep working on it. Maybe there'll be another way I can talk about 
that lack of self more because it's it means everything as to why these relationships don't work out and person after person has to go through all this pain and suffering with somebody with BPD who's, yes, going through their own pain and suffering too, but still. Yes, the uh, commenter said too, and it's very hard to emphasize with them while they at least seem to be okay with making you suffer. Well, I don't know if that's always a conscious thing, if they sit down and think, well, I'm okay if you suffer, screw you, could get to a thought like that. All they know, and this is the problem because everything starts off with all that they can't handle because <clears throat> they don't know who they are. And they're not sure what's happening to them because so much of what's happening is, you know, they get triggered, dysregulated emotion. That's not when they become a psychopath, ladies and gentlemen. And borderlines aren't narcissists, okay? There are 40% that might have some comorbidity with uh, NPD. There are 60% that don't. They talk about secondary psychopathy. They talk about uh, all these people out there all over the internet. They talk about or write about this idea of antisocial personality disorder being so close to BPD and every borderline woman. And we, no, uh, there, there's in the studies that I've read and, and other YouTubers know this too. Well, I think some know, but they just blow the stats anyway. Right now, as it stands, what I've read, and I don't believe everything I read, but I'm just saying what they're saying in their pseudoscience, not sure, not replicated studies, is that it's 1.2% of all women with BPD. All women diagnosed with BPD, 1.2% might have antisocial personality disorder. And with men, it's a little bit higher, but it's still under 2%. So I've seen these studies. I don't know. There's lots of other things out there that say different things. But at the end of the day, they just don't know who they are. And so it's not okay that they abuse you or hurt you because they're actually really using you. And even sometimes they may not know that. And people with BPD are not the 60% that has no comorbidity with um, NPD. And, of course, the 98% uh, that has no comorbidity with ASPD, uh, people diagnosed with BPD, they aren't fully developed people. They don't have an authentic self. Abandonment trauma kills the otherwise burgeoning authentic self. There's a quote from Melanie Klein in Object Relations Theory. And so they just have this part relational, you know, loss of self thing going on there. And it's, it's nothing to build a relationship on. It's not even anything to be a person with BPD's favorite person with. And I was answering a question on the channel the other day where somebody talked about being um, split to devaluation and blocked and um, devalued and, and I guess discarded by their person with BPD, they were their favorite person. So they were the favorite person of the borderline. And they were saying, well, they hope that they can get back and everything. But no, there's there's no road back after that. And if you're the favorite person of somebody with BPD, as this commenter did say, I think that they've been friends for a long time. But you know what? To be the favorite person of a borderline is not to be the borderline's friend. It's just not the same thing. And unfortunately, they do use and abuse a lot of people a lot of the time. And I'm not saying it's all conscious, but whether it's conscious or not, it's not anything that anybody should settle for. And so I really feel for the commenter for what he described here, which was really accurate. And then um, I just wanted to say one thing about sometimes I feel they can only access their own feelings when mirrored through the other. I, I could see why you would think that. I don't think it really is like that. But they aren't good with their own feelings because they don't have a container of self within which to feel those feelings in any consistent, congruent way whatsoever. So it's like their feelings are always just bouncing off, yes, other people. Um, they're trying to seek identity through partners or favorite people, favorite person. And... It's all too much. It's really all too much. And so I would say if you're still on that line, that fence, and you don't know what to do, and maybe you've been ghosted, 
Maybe you're not sure if you were discarded, but you want that Hoover. You want a reverse Hoover. You can't stop trying to be in contact with them. Wow, you know, I'm out here to work with you if I resonate with you, if you'd like to do some work, because people need to get out of these relationships. And to do that, no contact is very important most of the time. And you really need to be able to break the trauma bond. And the suffering that the commenter mentions that you go through with them, and the suffering when nothing is working out, and the suffering in between what might be a ghosting to maybe a further discard or another relationship recycle and then another breakup, that's beyond torture, actually, almost. And people suffer incredibly with that. And I would just say, you know, if you're somebody who's really suffering right now, you should reach out to whoever you resonate with. If it's me, great. If it's someone else, whatever. And uh, really start to get some help and support so you can start to transition out of. You don't need to wait till they throw you away. Why, why would you allow that to happen to you? Because people lose themselves and it all falls apart so unceremoniously, so tragically, so really constantly, and usually after not much time in an idealization phase. Some people say they don't even get an idealization phase. Some people say they get two months. Some people say it's a month. Some people say it's four months. It's not really a whole long time, though, when you consider that that person you first met, you got a whole lot of ideas about that you're just going to continually, constantly see as nothing to do with who they are. They're not the person that you thought they were. And how many people are hanging around because codependency is hard, breaking a trauma bond is hard. You're hanging around because you think maybe, just maybe, just maybe. But no, no, it's not going to work. Not just maybe, not just maybe, maybe. No. And I've had clients who've come to me after they've tried recycling relationships 15, 20 times. And I'm not exaggerating. And it's never going to work. That false hope. And then what are you doing to yourself when you're abandoning yourself for that false hope and when you're focusing on them all the time and when the breakup happens or the ghosting or the discard or, or you're breaking up too, but then the no contact comes when you're not ready maybe yet. Nobody's really ever ready. We just have to help people to take steps to take action steps, to, to be working on things, to keep working for change in your life. People just lose themselves in these relationships because none of it makes any sense. Though this commenter sounds like he really understood it well, and I hope something in what I said might help somebody to think about getting help, or if you want to work with me, I'm out here to, to work with you if you resonate with me. Or maybe just to even get you to think about why are you still there? And you might be thinking about that, but you might not have the answer to how in the heck are you supposed to make any change? Like if they don't make you make change, if they don't just boot you out of their life, what are you going to do? Well, you have to find a way to care enough about yourself to be able to stop focusing on them long enough to be able to start doing some of your own healing. And it's tragic all the way around, you know, because I don't think everybody with BPD is trying to be horrible on purpose. I don't think everybody with BPD is, they're not narcissists, okay? So some have comorbidity, but 60% of them don't, and they're not narcissists. And it's too bad that so many people out there now are just saying that borderlines and narcissists are, are, narcissists are exactly the same, because they're not. They have similarities, they have overlaps, and they have differences. And there are two different categories for a reason. People out there say things like that are as silly as this. And it, 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 three things. If a person has three things and you know they're a borderline, well, this isn't accurate. What would those three things be I've heard said out there? Oh, they devalue, they split, and they discard. Those aren't three things because splitting, devaluation is part of splitting, so that's one thing right? Idealization to evaluation, splitting, one thing. And if they discard, well, not all people with BPD discard. Not all people with BPD are the same. And just remember to just make it even more complex for wherever you might be today. 
there are 256 different symptom combinations in borderline personality disorder. It doesn't mean anybody has all of them. But to say that all people with BP are like, this is all I ever see. I hear it on YouTube. I read it on those websites where everybody's writing everything about everything. So much misinformation out there. But all you need to deal with today is you. And that can be hard because you can be in so much pain and you don't know how to break the trauma bond. And you don't know how to walk away. You don't know how to take care of yourself. Like really take care of you and focus on you. These are the things that you need to watch more of my videos if I resonate with you. I talk a lot about that, a lot about codependency. You need to realize that this relationship isn't going to work out. You're losing yourself. And some people are almost out of themselves, if you know what I mean. They're just so lost, so hurting, so feeling like they don't want to be here anymore. It's dangerous. You need to get away from these people who are untreated and going to put you through a ringer that it's going to take you some time and effort and a lot of investment in yourself. And it's, it's painful, but you can do it and it's worth it. And that is to heal, to be able to break that trauma bond, be able to heal your codependency and to be able to deal with whatever happened in your family of origin or your childhood. So these relationships really usually hardly ever work out. And so if you're wondering why yours isn't and you think it needs to and you still have hope, I hope you'll ask yourself some new questions today. Take care.